Welcome to the Inside Scoop Live podcast, where indie authors get personal about their books, their writing, and their passions. I'm your host, Sherry Hoyt. Join me for some lively conversations with debut indie authors and seasoned veterans alike. It's a great place to find your next amazing read or even get inspired. So sit back and enjoy the show and let me know what you think. Well, hi, everyone. Randy Richardson is here today to talk about his latest novel, Havana Hangover. It's a thrilling tale of friendship, betrayal, and survival set against the vibrant backdrop of Havana, where a bucket list trip unravels into a high-stakes adventure filled with suspense, humor, and political intrigue. Before we get started, here's the inside scoop on the author. An accomplished attorney and award-winning journalist, Randy Richardson is the founding member and president of the Chicago Writers Association. His latest novel, Havana Hangover, earned recognition as a 2023 finalist for the Kindle Book Awards and the BestThrillers.com Book Awards, and received five-star reviews from Reader Views and Reader's Favorites. With two more novels, Cheeseland and Lost in the Ivy, plus a co-authored nonfiction work titled Cub Sessions, Randy's influence spans genres. His essays grace anthologies like Chicken Soup for the Father and Son Soul, Storytellers, True Stories About Love, and Cubby Blues, and literary journals such as Hypertext and Memory House. As the first male recipient of the National Federation of Press Women's Communicator of Achievement Award, Randy is featured on New City's Lit 50 Who Really Books in Chicago list for 2019 and 2022. You can learn more about Randy Richardson and his work at randyrichardson.co. Well, hi, Randy. Welcome to Inside Scoop Live. Thank you. Thank you for having me. It's a great pleasure to be here. I've been uh, listening to your podcast for a couple of weeks now, and I've really been enjoying it. Oh, great. Thank you. Yeah. Well, I'm excited to hear about your newest novel, Havana Hangover. Why don't you tell us what it's all about and maybe what inspired the story? Okay. Yeah. So Havana Hangover, it's not just about alcohol, although rum does play a fairly big role in the uh, story. It it is inspired by uh, some real life adventures of my own, but it's all fiction. It's a spy thriller that is told from the point of view of Tanner Ford, who is a 30 year old Chicago corporate lawyer who goes on a bucket list trip to Cuba with Jackson Swift, his estranged best friend from law school. So these two have all kinds of history behind them, and most of it isn't good. (laughs) The last time Tanner saw Jackson was five years ago uh, when Jackson married Tanner's ex-girlfriend. So that kind of gives you an idea about their backstory. (laughs) Oh, wow. A little rocky road, huh? (laughs) A little bit, yes. So when Jackson uh, asked Tanner to go on a trip to Cuba with him, something that they had talked about when they were in law school, Tanner agrees to go on this trip, uh, thinking that it's an opportunity for him to finally confront Jackson about what happened between the two of them in their past. But when they arrive in Havana, Cuba, Jackson keeps evading his questions. And there are other things that just don't seem to quite add up for Tanner. And he starts to wonder what's going on. And on their first night out, Tanner meets this mysterious beauty at a nightclub in Havana. And he ends up leaving Jackson behind on a crowded dance floor. And the next morning, he wakes up in the bed of this mysterious beauty, and he finds that his cell phone has exploded with all these messages from Jackson. And the last message reads, help me. So at this point, he's hungover, he's confused, he's a little disoriented, and he's a little scared not knowing what exactly is going on. And it's from that point on where the story kind of unfolds. Tanner's dream vacation turns into this nightmare and a fight for survival where he is unwittingly thrown into this international conspiracy that leads right back to Jackson and that friendship that began in betrayal. Wow, what a story. That's awesome. (laughs) So based on a lot of your experiences, you said, yeah. How closely does it resemble the facts or is it very embellished? Well, I mean, obviously it's very embellished. I'm not a spy, <laughs> <laughs> but I am a lawyer. The friend that I travel with is also a lawyer and we we're best friends in law school. 
And the story is inspired by the four trips that we took to Cuba between 2016 and 2019. And it was on the second of those trips where at one point in the night, the two of us became separated. It was at a nightclub and uh, I ended up going back to our bed and breakfast. They call them Casa Particulars in Cuba. Oh. But I, you know, I went to bed thinking, you know, everything's okay. And the next morning I wake up and there's all these messages from him. And the last one reads exactly like in the book, it says, help me. And so I'm like freaking out right, you know, <laughs> first thing in the morning. And, you know, fortunately, unlike the story that I imagined, you know, I run out of my room to check his room and he's in there sound asleep as he should be. Um, you know, and I don't want to go into too much about, yeah. I don't really want to go into anything about what, you know, what the story is behind why he had, you know, sent all these messages. But the long and short of it is that he'd got locked out of <laughs> the, the room and he was trying to get back in. Oh, no. um, <laughs> so, you know, over the next two years, we kind of started joking about me writing a novel about our adventures there. And I started thinking about that as a sort of a starting point for it. And on the last trip there in 2019, we were sitting at this table at a cafe called La Farmacia. It was right by our Casa Particular. And we hung out there all the time. And we were there with my tour operator his wife and our tour guide. And that's when I told him that I had started writing this story. And at the time, you know, I really wasn't sure I was going to finish the story, mm. but they got so excited about it. And, you know, I told him that, you know, they were all kind of characters in this, you know, <laughs> except, except for the tour operator's wife. And so at the end of the night, you know, she, comes up to me and she taps me on the shoulder and she whispers in my ear and she goes, I want to be in your story too. <laughs> <laughs> and so now I have to create a character that I hadn't thought about. And she ends up becoming a critical character, although she's nothing like the real person in the book, but she becomes the ex-girlfriend of uh, Tanner who ends up marrying the Jackson character. Yeah. Okay. Um, so uh, that's how the story all kind of comes together. Uh, that's how I kind of like writing stories. I take these, you know, little nuggets and like to see, you know, if you change things just this little bit, how things would go differently. And this one went in a kind of a wild uh, adventure that I, you know, when I started it, I didn't really think about, although I did have a fairly good idea of how I wanted it to end. I love that story behind the story. It's so fun to hear how authors take the little snippets of truth and then, you know, create a whole story around it. I, I love that. Traveling to Cuba is a, it's an interesting story in itself. I probably could have told many, many stories. But this is just the one that came out of me. Yeah, I love it. And lots of potential for more stories as well. Now, Havana Hangover, what is the significance of the title and how does it kind of sum up the novel's themes and, and the tone of the story? To me, it was, you know, you play around with a lot of titles, uh, you know, and uh, that one just had a nice ring to it for one thing, but it kind of fit the theme of the story. I mean, there's a lot of, as I mentioned earlier, there's a lot of rum that is drunk in the story. And mm -hmm. so when tanner wakes up in that bed with this mysterious woman and and he gets this alarming message from jackson he becomes somewhat of an unreliable narrator at that point mm -hmm. you know he's hung over he's scared he doesn't know what's going on and he doesn't have clear memories of everything that happened the night before so he's disoriented as he's trying to put the puzzle together himself and so uh, the action then suddenly takes off when he sobers up and those pieces do start to come together. Mm -hmm. For me, I think that helps to add to the mystery because the reader is trying to figure out what is going on at the same time Tanner is trying to figure out what's going on. And, you know, it, it was fun to, to write it that way, at least. So. Yeah, yeah. And we kind of get the gist of the, the dynamic between Tanner and Jackson. Would you say uh, Jackson is the one that kind of controls how the relationship goes, what their friendship looks like? Yeah, he is definitely the more dominant figure in the relationship, at least in the outset. And, you know, w there are many backstories that are told in this. And, 
you know, Tanner always in those stories always seems smaller than Jackson. Um, and you get the impression, I think, that he's fascinated by Jackson and in a lot of ways wants to be more like him, even though in a lot of ways he's turned off by him too, for good reason. Mm -hmm. But I, I think we see as the story develops that Tanner grows a lot to the point where he no longer lets Jackson take advantage of him and he learns to fight back. And we see a lot of personal growth along with the healing that's going on throughout the story. Mm hmm. Wow. How does Havana's unique setting contribute to the overall narrative? And in what ways do you consider it a character within the story? Yeah, I mean, so, I mean, obviously, there's a long, complicated history between the United States and Cuba. And for the longest time, the doors to Cuba were largely closed to U.S. citizens. Mm hmm you know, due to the embargo that we've imposed on them for over a half a century now. So in 2016, that all changed, or at least changed to some degree, when uh, President Obama eased open the doors to Cuba for visitors from the United States. And that's when I started visiting there. Mm. You know, it, it had always been one of those places that I uh, had wanted to visit. I'm a huge Hemingway fanboy, you know, and I, <laughs> I visited most of the places that, you know, he's gone to, uh, kind of following his footsteps. And that was, you know, obviously the place that I'd never been able to go to. So as soon as I had the opportunity to go, I took advantage of it. And, you know, I had no idea what it was going to be like. And at the time, you know, when I started looking for a tour operator, the, the one thing that I asked for, you know, I, I wanted somebody who was going to basically let me schedule my own tour, like uh, create my own tour so I could do it the way that I wanted to do it. And that included visiting all the hangouts that Hemingway went to, including his house there in uh, Finca Villa, the bars that he would hang out, uh, included La Bodeguita del Medio. So... I wanted to do all that and experience all that, living the uh, Hemingway fanboy dream, I suppose, to some degree. But, you know, when I decided that I wanted to write this story of, that was based in my own adventures there, you know, that was basically four years later, four visits in. And I started thinking about all of the places that I'd seen and the things that I'd experienced there. And what really struck me more than anything in all those visits there is, you know, most of us don't really know Cuba at all. Most of us haven't visited there. Mm -hmm. We have all heard about it and we all have probably preconceived notions of what it's like. And, you know, my experiences there were much different than what I was expecting it to be. Mm. Obviously, there's a lot of poverty there. But there's an incredible amount of beauty there, too. But more than anything is what I saw there were the people there that were just these incredibly loving, beautiful people that were so happy to see people from the United States coming to visit them. Hmm. And that was something that I didn't expect at all. You know, I, <laughs> I, I really didn't know what to expect. But they were extremely welcoming and they, they wanted us there. And the reason that they wanted us there was because for them, us coming there brought them hope. For the first time in most of their lives, probably almost all of their lives, they actually started to feel hope because they felt like things were changing between the United States and Cuba. Unfortunately, that all changed back again and right after when the presidency changed and a lot of the opening that Obama brought, Trump basically shut down. He didn't completely shut it down, mm -hmm. but he made it a lot more difficult to go there. All the cruise ships were stopped from going there. You could still visit there and I still continued to visit there up until 2019. But I think most people thought that you couldn't go there at all. And, you know, it was understandable and it did become, you know, much more of a challenge to go there. But, you know, I'd done it before and I knew how to work my way around all the loopholes that you got to go through to get there. But I wanted to 
portray all of that into this story and in the context of these people who were feeling hope for really probably the first time in their life. But I also wanted to show the beauty of this country. And each time that I went there, I saw and I smelled and I heard something new. And I tried to portray all that in the story that I told. So like, you know, when the reader's along for a ride in a canary yellow Chevy convertible along Havana's Malacone, you know, this, the, which is the seven kilometer long seawall there, I wanted them to feel what I felt like when I made that same trip. And so that's what I wanted to show people through my story, what Cuba really is to me. And I write this in the end notes, it became kind of a, a love letter to Cuba and not really to Cuba, but really to the people of Cuba and to the hope that they had at the time when I first saw them. All of which has disappeared, unfortunately. Oh, no. um, really, almost everybody that I became friends with there, they've all fled the island. And things have gotten incredibly worse there. Not only when Trump started closing the doors again, but then the pandemic hit and they completely had to shut down the island to tourists. And, oh, right. and then they also attempted to do this really bad timing thing the government did there with uh, their economy, which was just incredibly bad timing. But it was like a perfect storm, really. You know, the country went into this complete economic collapse, probably as bad as it's been, you know, in the last half century. And that's really, really bad. So all of these people that it had hope in 2016 when I went there had lost all hope by, you know, 2022. And they've all fled the country. Most of them are either uh, some are in Spain, some have made it to the United States. I, in fact, it's funny, you know, just a few minutes ago, I got a message from one of my friends who I had worked with to help, you know, get her into here in the States. And she had just got her residency approved here. So, oh wow, but, yeah. So, I mean, it's that kind of thing, but it's really sad, you know, now she can't, you know, go back to Cuba until, you know, <laughs> things change because she's a U.S. resident. So, you know, the good and the bad are kind of commingling there in a really, you know, happy and sad way. So, I, you know, a lot of that I tried to portray so you could see exactly what these people are like and, you know, what they've had to go through. And one of the things that I've tried to portray also is that the policies of the United States, you know, while they're intended to punish the communist government there, what they really are punishing are the people who live and work there on a daily basis. It's not any of the people that are in power there that are really struggling there. It's the everyday people. And the sad part is, is most of the young people are leaving that country now. Mm. But what a wonderful opportunity that you had to see Havana during that time period before it went back into disarray again. Uh, I think that's just so special. That brought something special to your novel. And looking back now, it must have been just really kind of heartbreaking when you hear things going back to the way they were, or maybe even in some ways worse than how they were. Yeah, it is heartbreaking in a lot of ways. And, you know, for me, when I told you earlier, we, you know, that that last time in 2019, when I'm sitting at outside of that cafe, you know, with all these friends that I had made there, you know, it was a really happy time. And I assumed that, you know, I'd be going back there every November after that. And, mm. you know, unfortunately, been able to go back there since. Although, if things work out, I'm fairly sure that I'm going to be back there this November for the first time since 2019. Oh, wow. Yeah. Well, yeah, a lot's happened since then, hasn't it? For sure. A lot. Yeah. Wow. Yeah, I, I think it's really exciting you got to experience what you did. And then just seeing all of Ernest Hemingway's old stomping grounds and all, that yeah. had to be really special as a writer, especially someone that influences your work. How do you see Hemingway's legacy kind of influencing contemporary writers? Yeah, I mean, you know, Hemingway has a complicated legacy as well. <laughs> he was obviously a uh, alcoholic. His machismo of his day is uh, sort of 
frowned upon these days, I Mm. suppose. But he was an elegantly beautiful writer, and he used his own adventures to inspire his, his stories. And for me, that's what I take from him. You know, I love the idea of taking pieces from my own life and turning it just that little bit to see how things could have turned out very differently, which is, you know, essentially how this novel that I wrote, you know, that was in large part inspired by my own dreams of living the Hemingway fanboy and walking in his footsteps. The story that I wrote came out of that. It was very much Hemingway-esque, you know, and Mm -hmm. there's also a lot of alcohol in it, like uh, a lot of Hemingway novels do. (laughs) uh, You know, I dream of being able to write as elegantly as he does and uh, keep working on that. I don't know if I will ever reach that level, but I guess that's that's always what we uh, try to reach for. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. And with every novel, I'm sure your your style improves and it would just almost have to, you know. (laughs) Yeah, I mean, I hope so. You know, I've learned a lot over the years as a writer and and about myself, too. Yeah, yeah. Now, you balance a very strong sense of humor with suspense and drama. How did you find that kind of delicate balance between the humor and the tension? And I guess, why do you feel like it's important to include those lighter moments in the suspense thriller type novel? You know, the funny thing is for me, and I, you know, a lot of people comment about the humor in the book and, you know, when I'm writing it, I don't probably think of it because I think for me, humor to some degree just comes naturally. And I say things that other people think are funny (laughs) that I don't necessarily think are funny. Um, But I, (laughs) but I do think that it plays a really important factor in writing a suspense novel because a good story should be like real life. I mean, Mm -hmm. have feel all the emotions that come with it. And, you know, of course, with a thriller, you need that propelling story that keeps you turning the pages, but you also need those occasional moments where you're either going to cry or laugh. And that's to give it the believability, but also to amplify the suspense, which, you know, if you didn't have those lighter moments, you know, when you reach those high levels of suspense, they take on a bigger level when you, you know, lighten them a little before that with the, you know, the sense of humor. Mm -hmm. So yeah, I think it's really important bringing in all of those emotions that you can into a story, especially, I mean, I don't know if it's especially, but uh, thriller stories, I, I think often, we think of as, you know, just these page turners that you're supposed to just, you know, read from page to page and your, your heart's pounding the whole time, but you can't have that. It takes, you know, uh, usually for most people, it takes at least a couple of days. Sometimes some of us takes a lot longer to read a book. You can't keep that pace up. And Mm -hmm. so you, you lighten things up, slow things down sometimes, bring some humor in sometimes, bring a little empathy in at times, you know, bring some sadness at times, bring some love in sometimes, you know, every story should have all of those emotions. And I think uh, the best suspense stories have all of that. Yeah, I've read something about it crossing genres. But as you just put it, you know, most stories probably have a little bit of each of those elements. And, and so I think stories almost naturally cross genres, you know, I totally believe that. Yeah. Yeah. Now, did you have to do a lot of research for the story? Or did it all just kind of come together uh, based on your visits to Cuba? Yeah, I mean, to a large degree, those visits to Cuba were my research. Mm -hmm. But you know, there are little details that I needed to do that you just can't either remember or you weren't able to get while you were there. I mean, each time I go there, I'm there for, you know, six days and, you know, you can't do everything that you always want to do. Right. So that's where a lot of the internet research that I did fills in. And for me, like the one piece that surprised me more than anything was, um, you know, this is a spy story and I was searching around, I think I did a Google search for Cuba and spies and it led me to this place called the Lord Spy Base, which I had never heard of. If I had known about this 
when I was visiting there, I would have probably tried to at least make an attempt to try to find it. I don't know if it would have been possible, but uh, the story is that it was, and maybe still is, very real, and at least from what my research tells me. And during the Cold War, it was said to be the biggest Soviet overseas listening post. Oh, wow. Reportedly, from what I learned, Vladimir Putin closed it in 2001. However, I read some news stories suggesting that he might have reopened it in 2014. Mm -hmm. So, you know, little nuggets like that, you know, like those are the kind of things that I never would have probably found when I was there. Right. If I thought it, um, you know, I would have probably tried to see if I could find out more about it. Um, but that was after uh, I had already uh, had my last visit there in 2019 that I learned about this. But yeah, it's a kind of a fascinating little story, and yeah. I and I built it into my my actual novel. So that is interesting. Oh, 2014, right around the time the uh, sanctions were lifted, right, or shortly afterwards. Yeah, yeah 2016 it, is when they. they oh, okay. They, so a little bit after that, yeah. Yeah, yeah. So you're an attorney and a former journalist, and your characters are attorneys. How does <laughs> how does your background or how did your background play into writing the story? Yeah, I mean, so I, this is my now my third novel, and as I've said before, they're they're all somewhat inspired by my own lives. And anybody who knows me can tell that you know the the Tanner character is very loosely based on me and so I'm you know I'm told from a first person narrative so oh. it's largely it's being told you know from my point of view so yeah I mean that's where a lot of you know I, I changed a lot about you know where he went to law school what his practice of law is the relationship between him and the character although that character was inspired by a real life character you know we have a much better character relationship than the characters in <laughs> the book, thankfully. So yeah, I mean, all of that comes into play when I'm writing my stories. And you know, I mean, I do know some writers who say that what they write is purely fiction. And like, I have a hard time seeing that. Like, I mean, from my own perspective, I couldn't see myself writing everything that I write as being purely fiction. I mean, everything that you write is inspired by something that you've done. It, might have been the very smallest thing, but it, in some ways it made who you are and the kind of writer that you are. Mm -hmm. And so all of that plays a role in, you know, what you're writing. So when I'm a journalist, you know, I, I think like a journalist I and I think like an attorney too, because I'm an attorney. <laughs> uh, you know, you, I can't stop that. <laughs> Sometimes I wish that I could, but that, <laughs> the reality of it is and um, you know all of that comes into my writing yeah yeah now you're busy you're the president of uh, chicago writers association and organizer of the let's just write conference what i always wonder is how does someone have a full-time job all this extra involvement in the literary community and still have time to write you know how do you do all that and how important is the writing community for an author's growth yeah. Yeah, so I look at it this way, like in terms of the time, it's all a set of priorities. <laughs> like you you prioritize what you want to do and like when I set out to write a novel, I set aside a certain amount of time to work on that novel. Mm. And it's always a difficult juggle, you know, I have a family life too. I you know, my son thankfully now is in college, but Back when I first started writing, you know, he was a little kid and, you know, I was coaching baseball and all that kind of <laughs> things. I feel like now, like I have so much time compared to, you know, even a few years ago. <laughs> yeah. Oh, that's probably true. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So when people ask, you know, where do you find the time? I mean, we always have the time. It's just whether you actually make the time to do what you really want to do. And that's the way I look at it. And in, in terms of, the Writers Organization. I was one of the original founders of the Chicago Writers Association, and I've been the president for over 15 years now. Oh, wow. I largely started it because at the time that I started, well, really after I finished my first novel, which was called Lost in the Ivy, I felt like my protagonist, where I was lost and didn't know what 
where to go or what to do because there was no real writing community. And I sort of latched on to this, what was then just a Yahoo group that was started by another lawyer named Diana Lascaris. And at the time, you know, we had 50 people in that Yahoo group and that's all it was. And at some point, Diana stepped away and she asked me to take over the Yahoo group as the administrator for a while. And I sort of took over a little more than I think she intended. <laughs> I started asking people to do things. I asked somebody if they wanted to create a newsletter and somebody volunteered to do that. I asked somebody if they wanted to uh, create a website. And this was in the early days of websites, you know, And uh, but we had somebody who was tech efficient. And so we created our own little website at the time and it just kept growing from there. And then eventually we created it into a, a, a nonprofit. But I mean, the way I look at it is like, when I first started out, I had no idea what I was doing. And I think a lot of writers are in the same boat that I was. I mean, I, I didn't even study creative writing in college. I, mm -hmm. I studied a little bit of everything but creative writing. Mm -hmm. So I, I didn't really know anything about that world, and I didn't have any connections in that world. But you compare that to today where, you know, I've got so many connections that I can draw from. I mean, the editor that I had for my book was somebody that I found through my writer's organization. The publisher of my book was somebody that I found through uh, somebody who interviewed us on a podcast. And the writers who blurb the back of my book, those are all people that I've met over the years and in, in my work on the Chicago Writers Association. So to me, it's just opened up this whole new universe that literally didn't exist in my life before. Yeah. And I just feel like as writers, we can and should all work together and support one another. I found that if you give a little, what you get comes back tenfold. And that's the way it's worked for me. And so, yeah, so it's, it's an important part of it to me. Yeah. Oh, absolutely. So how long has Havana Hangover been out now? It's been a, almost a year now. So. Oh, okay. Wonderful. Wonderful. So since its release, what has been the most interesting or unexpected feedback you've received from readers? Uh, uh, <laughs> so <laughs> the one thing I can say positively is that, you know, the reviews of it have been overwhelmingly positive and like, surprising to me <laughs> how positive they've been, which is very flattering and very nice. I guess the one thing that's been, I, I, I guess I didn't see when I wrote this, and maybe I should have seen it, is everybody asks about the ending. <laughs> and, you know, and I, I, obviously I can't talk about that here, right. but it, it, you know, the one thing that everybody wants to know is, is does that mean that there's going to be a sequel to it? And at the time that I wrote it, I hadn't really thought about it. But when everybody started asking me about that, I kind of decided, okay, well, maybe I have to actually try to write a sequel to this, which, you know, when I was writing it, it wasn't even in my mindset at all. So this year, I set out to actually start writing that sequel. And so I started the sequel, which is it's a little bit different, at least the way that I've started. And, you know, you know, who knows how it's going to end. But it's told, again, from Tanner's perspective. But I'm also adding the perspective of the woman who is the mysterious woman in the, that he meets up at the beginning of the story and uh, who he leaves at the end of the story. Um, so it's told from her perspective and from his perspective. So it's I've got two point of views that are, you know, kind of commingling and in the story they're separated which is why I, I have them telling their own stories and at some point obviously they're going to meet and you know, I haven't quite figured out how that's going to go but <laughs> it could be interesting yeah well good well that was going to be my next question or, or <laughs> will there be a sequel so <laughs> good something to look hopefully forward to yes. yeah hopefully yes yeah well Randy is there anything else you wanted to add today no, no, I think you covered everything. You know, if people want to find out more about me or about my books, they can go to my website. It's randyrichardson.co. Uh, no M in the end there, just .co. And all my uh, social media links are on that website and they can connect with me there. I'm always welcome to uh, interacting with people, if, whether they're writers or readers. So, yeah. 
All right. Well, wonderful. Well, thank you so much for coming on the show today and, and sharing a little bit about yourself and your work. I've enjoyed it. Oh, well, thank you for having me. Thank you so much for joining me today for my interview with Randy Richardson, author of Havana Hangover. You can learn more about Randy at randyrichardson.co. And be sure and check out our other interviews at InsideScoopLive.com.